We are now live streaming here on Facebook. And this is a special day because we are uh, looking at uh, a turning point in the early church, a time when uh, something actually uh, changed. You could call it almost a, a sea change where life got different for uh, the the church as it moved forward. So welcome today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the fellowship of joy. Would you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us as his disciples to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Before you, you see a picture of Lydia. I have no idea if this looks anything like Lydia. I rather doubt it does. Lydia of Thyatira, of whom it is said a, a certain woman, Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. Now, as we move up to that a little background on why this is important. The good news, the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ uh, is a blessing to the world. It is a movement that grew out of ancient Judaism. That was the context and then spread from uh, people group to people group and into all the nations, uh, because God is a universal God. Now, it's take, it, it took centuries for people to figure this out, that God is a universal God, that there is one God, and that that God cares about all the people of the world. And yet, even before it was fully understood, uh, the people of Israel would pray, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Selah, it's a musical notation. That your way may be known upon the earth, the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples Praise you. That's the nations, the peoples, the, the Gentiles. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Selah. Sing it again. <laughs> let the peoples praise you, O God. Oh, let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. Father, our prayer today is that we would find something in you, in your glory, in your fatherhood of the nations, in your love for all people, in your glory, in your holiness, in your creativity that would bring us together in the place of worship that we could fall down before you, that we could uh, shake off our differences while celebrating our uniqueness, and that we could be your people indeed. That one thing that makes us all human and uh, alive, uh, that is that spark of your image that is in all nations and all peoples as we call men and women and boys and girls to faith in Christ and to believe the gospel. May it be that good news that repentance is possible, that change is 
uh, uh, something that you offer to us that our minds and our hearts can be changed from sin and self selfishness, from greed and avarice and violence and uh, injustice and guilt and shame, and that we can turn to hope, that we can learn to love, and that there can be uh, your peace abiding upon us. May that bring us together, O oh God, today from all the corners of the earth to praise you today, O oh God. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him all above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. So we want to uh, focus on a incident from the life of Jesus in John 5, uh, 1 through 9. Uh, as we ask the question, who it is that God really cares about? And when Jesus comes and seeks someone out, he goes to a place where there are a lot of broken people gathered. In John 5, 1 through 9, uh, it says that uh, after this was a festival of the Jews, Jesus went up to Jerusalem after the festival. Interesting. Now, in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool called, in Hebrew, Beth Zatha. Uh, you, through history, we sometimes call it, uh, call it Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. If I might pause a moment and say, isn't it interesting how Jesus chooses the places he goes uh, by the people he will find there? One man was there who'd been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Well, that's some question, isn't it? I mean, the man had been coming to that place uh, where others like him had been coming. He was believing a story. He was believing uh, what... Well, may have seemed to most to be a legend, but it was a, a legend of hope that an angel would come and disturb the water and that the first one in would get a healing blessing. Sounds superstitious to us, but the man believed it and uh, many believed it and it became his place where he found healing because uh, the great disturber uh, showed up. Well, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Well, it, it raises a question. Who gets the blessing? Who gets the healing? Who gets the a touch of God's grace in this world? Who does God care enough about and about to, uh, to touch? with healing grace and healing power. Is it the first one in? Is it the one who can push off everybody else? It is, is it the one who uh, is chosen for a special blessing above everyone else? It is, the one, uh, is it the one who has all the friends who would throw them in the water first? Who is it? Who is it? So Jesus singles out this man who says, there's not an option for me, but I keep showing up. Uh, but as far as I understand my options, I don't have any. You ever been like that, where you felt like you really didn't have any options, and yet uh, you'd hold out for the one thing that you thought might work? Well, Jesus said to him, stand up, take up your mat and walk. Well, at once the man was made well, and he took his mat and began, began to walk. Now that day, was the Sabbath. Well, we could spend a lot more time there. We could uh, dig, and, and I know that there's gold to be mined in this, uh, in this particular passage, but we're going to move on. We're going to uh, let that ruminate and let that you marinate in that, and we're going to move ahead to uh, the culmination of time and space and history, the new Jerusalem. What is it like? What is it that Jesus previews in his ministry and in this gospel that pertains to the nations, that pertains to the outcasts, that pertains to the broken and the crippled and the hopeless and the disappointed, to you, 
and to me. Revelation 21.10, and then uh, in 22, uh, verse 1 through 22.5. Uh, it's a beautiful depiction of that, isn't it, by, um, from the New, New, New uh, Bible. And in the spirit, he carried away, uh, me away uh, to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for the temple of the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. In other words, God doesn't need to be contained in anything now because God's presence is fully uh, revealed and there's nothing that uh, separates him from the people that live in this new city. And, in this, and the city has no need of the sun or moon to shine in it for the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory to it. Look at this. Let me zero in on it a little bit. The, the nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, it's going to be a pure city. It's, it can't be corrupted by anything in our humanity that corrupts things. The angel showed me the, the river of the water of life. Again, there's a river. There's, there's a body of water in, in these passages of Scripture today. That is a continuity. There's, there's one where the man comes to be healed. This is the ultimate river of life, uh, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb through the middle uh, of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit producing each its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the Healing of the nations, the healing of the nations. Who is God concerned with? Where is the healing? Uh, the healing of the nations. What needs to be healed in the nations? Well, uh, if I read the I read the news a few minutes ago, I saw a lot of healing needed in the nations. I saw a lot of healing needed in our nation. I saw a lot of healing needed uh, throughout uh, the world. If you um, if you Pay attention to the world. You know that there is a need for healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found in there, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on his forehead, their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever endeavor. That's a hopeful day. That's a beautiful day that John is given the privilege to see symbolically through the vision that he has on the Isle of Patmos. Father, today we pray for the healing of the nations because we have been given a glimpse uh, of your intention to heal the nations through this glorious river that flows from uh, your city from your place of abode, for, from your um, ultimate presence among us in the new Jerusalem. May our eyes be fixed on that kind of hope and that uh, vision of eternal reality that is coming into uh, play and that you will fully reveal when time is enveloped by eternity. And so, oh God, may you even now begin to heal the nations because you have told us that we are a part of that river now, your people, your messengers, your church, uh, through whom uh, the river uh, flows, even now the rivers of living water. May we be a conduit of rivers of living water, even now in our time, a preview of the unveiling of your ultimate kingdom. 
uh, for healing of all who uh, come into proximity with us through whom your water of life flows uh, into our world today. Uh, we don't understand the mystery of, of, uh, of uh, already and not yet. We don't try to sort it all out. I don't. Uh, how uh, this temporal time can be a glimpse of eternity and how eternity can wipe out everything else. How we who are impure and yet we get to enter uh, because you have purified us. We look forward to that day when all things are settled. And when we live in a city that is, um, that is absolutely free of any impurity in our lives and any uh, false motives in our lives. But we pray that you would uh, open our hearts to that ultimate reality that your grace, your love, your peace, your reign is in the process of coming to pass, even uh, among the nations that need your healing, even among uh, the kings who are unjust, who uh, ultimately uh, submit to your reign. Um, whatever that means, oh God, and whatever it takes for you to bring it to pass, uh, may your kingdom come and your will be done today on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we're longing for something that's coming, and we get to participate in it. And we go to another body of water, and it is in Macedonia, and it is um, a place of encounter. Uh, and it is our primary scripture for this morning. Uh, and it comes from um, Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. So if you'll join me there during the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a, a man of Macedonia uh, pleading with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. I think we should spend a little time on Macedonia. Macedonia uh, existed in the in the world uh, as a uh, place and as an entity uh, from about 2000 BC. So by the time Paul is there, it's been over 2000 years of history. But there's also been, a, you know, 167, maybe 200 years of history uh, from the time that Alexander the Great and his father, Philip II, uh, founded the city. And then um, you know, 35, 40 years uh, from the time that um, that uh, Mark Anthony and Octavian uh, Augustus Caesar uh, had uh, taken over that whole region and had planted Roman rule there. Uh, in fact, it had become a colony of Rome, which we're going to read in the next uh, couple of verses. And it was a region of uh, the world that was under the direct rule of uh, the Roman emperor. And when Paul had seen the vision, we, now that means Luke writing is saying, I was there too. We immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God called us to proclaim the good news to them. That's that good news that we've been seeing pop up from Psalm 67, from John 1, 5, and from Revelation 21 and 22. The good news of the coming kingdom of God, the good news of the healing of the nations, the good news of the healing of individuals who are sitting uh, in that place of hope and hopelessness, the good news of uh, God's concern for all people. We immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Uh, we set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, the city that's named for Philip, uh, a colony of Rome, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. 
we remained in this city for some days. Uh, let's talk about this idea of being a Roman colony. Um, it means that everything about this city is a embassy of Rome. And, and imagine that if there is an embassy in the city, it's, it's a entity of uh, a foreign nation in the middle of it all. But this whole city is an embassy. And so everything inside that city is many Rome, culture, language, uh, a government, especially government values, and the openness that they have to ideas. Uh, if you are in Washington, D.C., and you step off the sidewalk and enter the gates of uh, a, the embassy of the, the nation of Greece today, or the nation of Turkey, or the nation of Italy, or some other nation, suddenly you are on the sovereign grounds, you are in the sovereign territory of that nation. And so when you were in, in the region of Macedonia and you stepped into Philippi, you were in, and really all of Macedonia had become sort of that colony, but especially the city of Philippi, you were in the sovereign territory of Rome. You were by all, by all reality, you were, you were in an embassy, you were in a colony of Rome. You were under the jurisdiction of Rome and you were under the protection of Rome, the, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And so later, Paul would say to the more established future um, community of Christians who were gathered at Philippi, uh, you are a colony of heaven. Because they understood what it meant to be a colony. And he's saying that the church has become like a colony of heaven, a colony of the kingdom of God, an embassy of the kingdom, a, a working out of what it means uh, for God's kingdom coming and God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. If you want a, a preview of what it means for the kingdom to be in the process of being developed on earth as it is in heaven, that's what he intends the church to be. Now, he acknowledges it hasn't been perfected because, for instance, Yodia and Tenthiki are having a big fight. Two of the prominent women in the community are having a fight, and he asks for uh, a, a, a yoke fellow, his, his partner, uh, one of his uh, leaders there to intervene and help these women because he values them highly but helps them to work it out. So Paul's in the, um, in the city for some days, and Luke's there, and others are part of their party. Now, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and, and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a deal, dealer in purple cloth. Now, Thyatira was a city that actually um, was a, an industry uh, leader in uh, the uh, production of the dye that uh, went into making cloth purple. And it was a luxury item. Uh, so she was a dealer in it. It may, may mean that she was a leader in the whole guild, but she was, a, she was a businesswoman. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Now, there are a lot of uh, bunnies we could chase here. And I, I do want to chase a couple of them. I want to chase uh, the word help a little bit. 
and I want to chase the word purple. Now, the word purple, the acronym I'm going to come up with purple, really doesn't have that much to do with purple, but the help, uh, it does. Um, but I want to think about Lydia herself and the group of women that are gathered by the river, seeking God, worshiping God, studying Torah. It takes uh, 10 faithful Jewish men who are heads of households to establish a synagogue. And the fact that Paul goes to the river instead of going to the synagogue may indicate that there is no synagogue at the moment in Philippi, because perhaps there are not 10 faithful Jewish men who are heads of households. And yet there are a group of women who are either what we call God-fearers, or maybe they have a Jewish background. We just don't know. I mean, we really don't know. We're not given insight to that, but they are seeking God. And they are meeting regularly, it is implied, by the river to seek God, to study. So their hearts are primed. Now, a few days earlier, Paul, while he's still in Troas, has a vision. And interestingly enough, it is a man of Macedonia. Well, who is this man of Macedonia? Well, he's a, he's a vision. You know, it, he doesn't have to be anybody in particular. He's a vision. Uh, I had dreams last night. Did you have dreams last night? I had a couple that actually uh, bothered me a little bit. One was I was I was talking to somebody and it revealed something about myself that I didn't like. I was um, I was explaining something uh, to someone who uh, I felt myself uh, not being entirely honest. I was I was trying to protect that person. I was assuming that they could not uh, did not have the capacity to to make their own decisions. And so I was explaining why I had made their decision for them. It was, uh, you know. And I thought, wow, as I reflected upon that, as I woke up, I said, what is my mind and what is the spirit uh, trying to tell me about uh, how we, how we uh, sugarcoat the truth to, uh, to protect other people, not giving them the dignity to make up their own minds? Did I tell you too much? <laughs> I probably did. But uh, the, these are the kinds of things that I, uh, that I see, you know, when I let my mind go and my subconscious speak. And that's why I want uh, God to be speaking to me even while I'm dreaming. It's not that, that the things I see, the images I see are infallible, but Paul gets one that's a vision. It's somebody over in Macedonia. Now, has God been working in Paul's heart about Macedonia up to this point, and it's culminating in this dream? I'm, oh, maybe. Maybe. I don't know how dreams work uh, entirely. I'm no expert. Uh, I don't think there ever has been someone who's been a complete expert in this. Some people have studied it, but God spoke to him. And he processed it. He talked with the others about it. And they all determined that God was calling them over to Macedonia to help. And the word uh, that we're going to focus on a little bit is help. And I'm going to make an acronym out of help. It's a quick acronym. It doesn't, uh, it's not an infallible acronym, but uh, it's drawn out of the text. Uh, the first uh, letter in help is H. And what that, what that meant for Paul and Luke and the others was heeding the call. Heeding the call. If you're going to help, you have to heed the call. And sometimes that means getting up off of your uh, sweet intentions and getting into the, uh, the movement that's required to do what God is calling you to do, is to make yourself available to God. And the E, uh, ultimately it meant being down by the river and explaining the gospel to a group of people who were ready to hear it, who were no doubt 
praying. Their, their prayers uh, may have actually constituted this construction in the uh, sleep mind of Paul that uh, God uh, formed into a man of Macedonia calling for help. And then the third letter in help is listen, and that was what the women did uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, of Lydia, the dealer in purple, royal colors. Uh, they uh, heard, they listened, and they heard to Paul. And then it goes back to Paul and the group. They had to plant themselves there. They had to respond to the human invitation of uh, Lydia to stay there in Philippi, in fact, to stay in her house. She must have had a big house. I'm sure that she was a prominent woman with some money. That doesn't mean all those people there were, but she, who is pointed out as a leader, uh, had, a, had enough of a house and a household that she could welcome a group of apostles, uh, missionaries, teachers, to come and stay in her home and locate themselves there, maybe for as long as a year. Now, the, the next um, word I want to break down with an acronym is the word um, purple. <laughs> purple, because it's our color for the day. Purple. Uh, and it was Lydia's, uh, Lydia's lifestyle. It was that uh, business that she was in. And it's a great example. You know, Paul had a business that he carried around with him. It was a traveling business. He made tents and he did it for a living. But his, that wasn't his profession. His profession was the gospel. His vocation was the gospel, but he had the subvocation that enabled him to be in wherever he was, be in the moment and open doors for him. And this was the door opener for Lydia, the purple. And it gave her P for prominence. In other words, it, it put her in a position, you can make that the P if you like, where she could command some attention, where she could have some influence. And the good news that God's kingdom has come into the world through Jesus and there's new opportunity for repentance and faith and there is hope and there is the possibility of peace and there is redemption and reconciliation through the cross. Uh, all of this, uh, these elements of the good news are communicated by people who can influence other people. And who is that? Well, that's pretty much everybody. Everybody has influence over somebody. And what that influence, that P prominence, uh, gives you is a platform for proclamation and explanation and sharing. Not coercion, not exercising uh, undue power over people, because we're trying to get away from that in the kingdom of God, but that influence that uh, commands the opportunity for someone to hear. Can I go back to the word L? Because I want to use L in, in, in this purple, and I really want to substitute the L for listening, because I want to use that listening in purple. <laughs> but I want to I go back and say it was really location in help. But Paul had to be in a particular location to share the good news uh, to the women of Philippi. Now, okay, back to purple. Back to purple now that I've confused you. The U in purple is for the universality of the gospel. We're not in, uh, we're not in Jerusalem anymore. You're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. Yeah, we're not in Jerusalem. We're not in Judea. We're not even in Samaria. We have gone to the ends of the earth, uh, even though, you know, it's still traveling distance from uh, the uh, Levant region uh, that where uh, Jerusalem is. But here, here we are in the Greek world. 
in a world that pres prides itself in entertaining new ideas, there uh, is uh, this rather historically exclusive uh, tradition that Lydia and her friends are exploring uh, the literature and the legacy of the Jews and the Torah, uh, a God who is uh, proclaimed by the Jews and whose law to them, whose covenant with them is uh, codified and exemplified and uh, enshrined in the Torah, in that tradition. And they're studying this almost parochial message and history. And yet it is about to explode into a universal invitation that God is the God of all the earth, that the prophetic praise of Psalm 67 has come to the earth that, that all the nations come and the, the prophetic vision of Revelation 21 and 22, where the healing of the nations flows from the river of life. This message is for all people. There is the same God who shows himself to the whole world. And the R in purple is for the responsiveness of the women who heard this message and all who would hear it through them. The second P in purple is for the prayer. Prayer, they're, they're down there to pray. They're down there seeking God. Now they may not know God fully, but they're seeking God. And God hears their prayers. That was a controversy about 40 years ago in my denomination over whose prayers does God hear? And someone audaciously suggested that if you were not already in Christ, uh, God didn't hear your prayers. Well, that, that assertion is defied by the fact that the man of Macedonia representing the call of God has heard the prayers of these people who have not heard the gospel. And this happens throughout the book of Acts. It happens throughout the Bible. God hears the sincere prayers of people who are seeking him and are seeking the unknown. Well, the L here, I'm gonna bring back listening, right? Because the women listened and they listened intently to what Paul said. And then there's an E in purple at the end and it's embodiment. Uh, Lydia uh, was baptized and uh, Paul baptizes these, these who receive uh, the gospel. And then what is baptism? Well, baptism is a way of saying, I want to embody this. I want to take this into myself. I want to identify with this Jesus whose gospel, whose good news, whose sacrifice, whose life and death and resurrection uh, has some impact on my life. I want to identify with it. I want to embody this message. I want to join this uh, band of people. And so what happens as a result? Well, what happens as a result is the birth of the Philippian church. And if you want to read about more about that. I mean, you can read on here because, you know, the, the Philippian jailer becomes another conduit of all of this. And, you know, we'll talk about him on another day. Um, you know, Paul gets thrown in jail. He's not universally accepted there in Philippi uh, and it will never be uh, universally accepted. But then one of the jailers, when the place shakes and, and, and Paul and the company are released, uh, He's terrified. He says, what must I do to be saved? And believe in Jesus, Paul said. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And the baptism is, is uh, spreads, that embodiment spreads. And, you know, because Paul 
and, and the and the group go to his house and the whole household hears and after that just the explosion takes place and a church is born there in philippi and then you go back and read the book of philippians what a great four chapters of joy in that epistle the kind of joy that comes when people embrace you know embody embrace there's another e you know the thing about a great acronym is you can substitute words but the truth is, Lydia's influence and Paul's influence meet there by the riverside, where we're reminded of the river of life, the river of hope, the river that flows from the New Jerusalem, the river that flows through the lives of people who embody and embrace the good news, the river that is for the healing of the nations, even now, the river that is fresh and alive, the river that if we don't dam it up, can touch other people and make a difference in this broken world. The river that can, that you know, the, the lame and the, and the broken are sitting by and waiting for an angel to disturb it and, and that can, rem where they can meet Jesus who says, take up your bed and walk. I mean, there's so many ways that the metaphor plays out, but the reality is there's good news to receive and good news to share and God brings people together every day on this planet so that the good news can be shared back and forth. And I wanna be a part of that. I wanna be a part of that today. I wanna to be a part of that tomorrow. I wanna to be a part of that for the rest of my life. And will you say yes to the good news and yes to being a conduit for it? That's, that's the prayer I recommend today. You do what you will with it. But would you say yes to God? Would you be eager? And would you uh, ask uh, the Lord himself, not just his servant, come stay at my home? Uh, it will, that will be prevailing prayer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And amen, and amen again. If you'll go to my, uh, my, my blog in a little while, you can listen to this song, River of Life, uh, pastortomsims.com. I won't play it now, but I'll let Jesus' words be our ultimate benediction today. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word. And my father will love them, will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Um, I've said these things to you while I'm still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. And that's good news today, because anything I've confused you about, the Holy Spirit will teach you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I do not give it as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. I'll see you next week, my friends. God bless you. Bye-bye.